Obamacare. They tell us it's bringing a significant change in the way we will receive and pay for health care. But how will this program, shrouded in the political rhetoric of the campaigns, actually work? How will it affect you and your family? The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call, a television production promising to help people by providing useful health-related information based on honest science. About two and a half years ago, Congress passed the first major health care legislation since 1965 when Lyndon Johnson pushed through the Medicare and Medicaid Acts. The new law is titled the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and is generally shortened to the ACA, but has also been called by both parties and the president himself as Obamacare. What set the stage for this law, the ACA? Two problems. One, access. Another, cost. Aside from Medicaid, Medicare, and the Veterans Administration, health care payment in the United States has evolved into an employer-based insurance system unique to this country. But this system has brought about an access problem. By 2008, more than 46 million people were not covered because insurance companies have had to compete by not insuring and avoiding high risk and expensive patients. Too many people in the U.S. are not able to get access to health care insurance coverage. Diminishing access is a huge problem. And the cost of health care continues to spiral because the more you do, the more you make has driven our whole system of health care. Drastically growing hospitals, expensive pharmaceuticals, complicated technology, high-priced scanning machines, subspecialist physician services, and all kinds of procedures. Add to this a legal tort liability system that actually encourages people to threaten hospitals and physicians with lawsuits for any bad result. And thus, we have the most expensive system in the world. In fact, we are twice as expensive as the average of the world's top 15 most costly healthcare systems. Increasing cost, cost, is a huge problem. So to deal with the problem of diminishing access and increasing cost of health care, our federal leaders have brought us a new law about which we will discuss tonight. This is a special edition of our show conceived to dissect out the facts and truths about the ACA. We promise to do our level best to make this non-political, favoring no candidate, no party, but to provide only what we understand as the facts and the truth. To make this happen, we need your questions, either from you, the live audience here in this room, or from you in the television audience. 
please watch the screen for the number to call or the email address to send. And here to help us answer your questions. We are indeed fortunate to have two practicing primary care physicians who are extremely knowledgeable about the ACA. Tom Dean, MD, was raised and practices family medicine in Wessington Springs, South Dakota, trained at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and residency at the University of Washington, Seattle. Dr. Dean is on the powerful National Committee of Medical Experts called the MedPAC, advising the U.S. Congress on health care policy. Fred Ralston, MD, was raised and practices general internal medicine in Fayetteville, Tennessee, trained at Yale University of University uh, Tennessee School of Medicine and residency at Baptist Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Ralston has recently served as the national president of the American College of Physicians, a national organization of about 130,000 internal medicine doctors whose purpose turns around physicians and patient education. And we would like you, our viewers, to join this discussion with your questions. Call 1-888-376-6225. You may also email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. We especially want to thank Swiftel here in Brookings for providing the necessary internet connections and telephone routing so that we could do this program live from our town meeting here at the Community Life Center of the First United Methodist Church of Brookings. Welcome, gentlemen. Let's start with what, what is it that has made you knowledgeable about the ACA? Tom, let's start with you. Well, I think ever since uh, I got involved with medicine, I've had an interest in how the system works and how it's structured and where it has strengths and where it uh, doesn't function as well, and that has evolved through involvement with a number of different organizations uh, to study uh, the uh, workings of this and became, I became more and more troubled over the last probably 10 to 15 years about the problems that you alluded to. And uh, so have, have felt that we needed some major changes, but, uh, and so the, when the, this proposal came along, it was a proposal of great interest. And uh, it's one that I support, but it certainly has many strengths and many weaknesses. Um, you know, six years ago, you were asked by, what, the Republican president? I mean, is he the one who appointed you? Uh, and not to talk politics, but you were, you've been on this leading, leading committee for six years, uh, but you're not speaking for them. Right. The uh, uh, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which is short for, or which is the full name of MedPAC, is an arm of Congress that advises Congress on Medicare policy, but it's a, but anything, and so it's, it's been a great opportunity to learn a tremendous amount about the Medicare program, which is a very big and complicated yeah. program. But uh, any, but my position here, I'm speaking for me and not for, oh. not for MedPAC. All right. Now, Fred, I mean, I've known you because you and I were members of the Internal Medicine Committee or organization called the ASIM that kind of involved, evolved into the, and joined with the ACP, and you were the president this last year of the ACP. Uh, did that have anything to do with your knowledge about uh, this ACA thing? Well, I, I've been a lifelong student of, of politics. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor but from a very young age was interested in how different societies make the rules that we live under. So in high school, I was lucky enough to get to be an intern in the US Senate. In college, I majored in political science. Um, and since that time, I've sort of interwoven my practice uh, and been lucky enough to have leadership positions in the American College of Physicians. So I was involved as chairman of our Health and Public Policy Committee in writing a number of, of pieces of policy that did um, have influence in the uh, in the ACA and have met with leaders of Congress and at the White House on several occasions in, in trying to figure out better ways to, to change health care. 
but I provide sort of a unique perspective in that I often tell people at the ground level in Fayetteville, Tennessee, the governmental leaders are not nearly as bad as they perceive them to be, but also tell governmental leaders sometimes that the real facts on the ground aren't always what they perceive them to be. And I think that we need to find a compromise and a middle ground, and there are just many opportunities for us to improve health care in this country. I, I think that, uh, and, and I have to say one more time, that uh, neither one of you are interested in promoting a, a political thing here. This is all fact, fact time. That's you're in agreement, and I'm totally in agreement with that. We may irritate some people. They may say we were on one side or another. I am not doing that. I think, uh, for my part, and you guys have agreed, this is non-political. This is a fact-finding deal, talking about health care policy at its basis. Rick, I think, I think you deserve huge credit for taking that position because these are very big and very important and extremely complicated issues, and we need serious, honest discussion, not sound bites. And unfortunately, that is what comes to dominate so much of our public uh, discussion. And, and I know the three of us can do this, but I hope with our audience and with the viewers at home, we can make an honest attempt to talk with each other, not at each other, because we can accomplish so much more. We can get some things done Absolutely. here. And there's some changes that, uh, that could be accomplished as a result of such a thing. Um, I want to make one, one question now. Uh, I've heard this three times from people. That book, of policy is that long, nobody's read it. What's your comment about that? Well, I haven't read it, but there certainly are a number of very smart people who have read through the whole thing. I have some summaries here that have been prepared by analysts that, that do understand and have tried to summarize it. So it's true, it's big and complicated, but uh, it, I think we know what's in it. And remember, let's compare it to what we lived under before the ACA. Anybody want to count the number of pages involved in the original Medicare rules as amended over the years? Or has anybody read their full private health insurance contract with their health insurance? <laughs> it's complicated business, and we really do need to find the most important elements. And I don't know any piece of legislation, even if it was one page long, that couldn't be improved by thoughtful people sitting together in a room and, and having an adult discussion. I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start taking some of these questions. Um, uh, there is a, uh, a question about positive and negative ramifications of having a health care program like the Affordable Care under a national umbrella as opposed to programs run by each state. I've heard the state question versus national. What is your take on the state versus national? Couldn't we do this on a statewide basis? Well, my state, Tennessee, tried to experiment years ago with um, a program to provide coverage to almost everyone in the state. And we border on many other states. And we actually had people moving to Tennessee if they were in need of heart transplants and other high cost um, uh, interventions. So it really is very difficult for us to have an island within the states. Uh, a little known provision of this is that states can have their own plan if they figure out a way to document that they've provided equal or superior coverage. And there was talk at one time that Vermont, for example, might go a different uh, way and have their own plan. And that's perfectly fine and consistent with our sort of uniquely American approach. I think another perspective on that is that we have a lot of employers, for instance, who have uh, employees in multiple states, and it makes it exceedingly complicated and difficult for them to administer any kind of program that doesn't have some consistency across state lines. And we see that especially in the Medicaid program right now, which of course is not related to employers, but uh, there's is great variation and uh, problems in uh, administering that. Uh, we've got a question about, will this force poor people to buy insurance? Uh, the answer to that is it will enable poor people to obtain insurance if they're 
right now in the gap between those who qualify under the Medicaid program and those who can afford it. And that's actually probably one of the greatest strengths of the Affordable Care Act. It would give the opportunity for those people to have their cost pretty much taken care of. And, and we find over the years that people who live without health insurance live sicker and die younger. And there's a huge cost. I mean, why do you think that is? I mean, people who don't have insurance live sicker and die younger? I'm well, I know personally from uh, patient experiences and, and individuals in my community, people who knew they had breast cancer or knew they had colon cancer who declined to go to the doctor because they knew they could probably get the care, but it would bankrupt their family. And human nature being what it is, we often put off things, even if there's an easy solution. But in that situation, when you're trying to protect your, your spouse and your children, it just provides all the wrong incentives. The, uh, the Institute of Medicine, which is one of the most respected uh, medical advisory bodies, a, a branch of the National Academy of Sciences, has estimated there are 18,000 premature deaths each year because of lack of access to uh, 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 the insurance. people who don't have insurance. That's what I'm trying to say, yes. And, and there's also good evidence that in those states that have expanded access to Medicaid, for instance, that health outcomes have improved. And the same Institute of Medicine has actually tried to calculate how much we spend on those uninsured. And even if they get care later as a society, we spend often as much or by some estimates more than we would have spent to provide them the appropriate care and have them continue to be a productive member of society. All right. We'll be back in just a minute. Well, that is a commonly held conviction that the Affordable Care doesn't do enough to limit cost increases. And I agree with that, that it doesn't do enough, but actually does quite a bit. And several parts of the act that never get discussed have to do with reining in costs. So for example, the Affordable Care Act created a new part of Medicare called the uh, CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And this is a part of the agency that runs Medicare, CMS, that is charged with trying to define new ways of paying for health care that are cheaper and better. And one of the amazing things about CMMI is if they find something that works, they can simply change the way Medicare works. They don't need anybody's permission. They don't need to go back and get new laws passed. So if they discover something that actually saves money for the system, they can just do it. idea of innovation, what's your take on it? Well, one of the critiques of government over the years has been that they've sometimes been a little too, too big to make the modifications that are, that are needed. They've recruited a wonderful internist from private practice in Philadelphia, Rich Barron, who's leading this agency. And they have the ability to test new ideas that can work at the ground level. And if they're shown to be beneficial to, to patients, either on cost or quality, then they have the ability to become part of the Medicare program. I'm excited about that. That sounds like a really good idea, Tom. I, I agree completely. It, it, we clearly need to find more efficient and effective ways to provide the, the services that we are. So, and there, there are models, uh, both that around the country, of places where really good Innov things are being done, innovation. And this is a way to encourage even more of that. And this is improving something we're already doing. I mean, people talk about government control of, of health care. We're already financing about half of the health care in the country. With, with Medicare, with, Medicaid, and VA. Through, through government expenses. And so this Center for Medicare um, Innovation and Improvement has an ability to improve those patients who are already covered under Medicare and make that better and more efficient. I think another uh, little known fact that there's, there's a, as we all know, there's a, a strong sort of anti-government uh, mentality in, in the U.S., and some of that's legitimate and well-founded, uh, but there is, unfortunately, at times, the, the belief that the government can't do anything right. And, and one of the things that I think people don't know 
is that Medicare, for instance, operates a very efficiently. The overall investment, the overall cost of administering the Medicare program is about 3 to 4 percent of the Medicare budget, which is substantially lower than, than any private insurance company operates at. So, so we are getting a good deal, but we need to do even better. There's a question that uh, follows that as far as uh, the VA. How will this affect veterans or veteran disability and Social Security? This really is going to run parallel to that. Right now, the VA has uh, been operating their own health care system and uh, been doing a, a good job, particularly with some modernization over the last few years, and that shouldn't take anything away from the VA. All right, nothing, nothing to the, and this same caller from here and said, are there hidden laws within the ACA concerning, for example, gun control? I don't believe so. No, and I actually know people who've read it and uh, yeah, there no, is I don't nothing. That's true. It's not oh. So nothing to do with gun control. Uh, if they pass this, will they reduce health care insurance prices? Now that's the big issue. As soon as uh, uh, the, that the ACA was passed, insurance costs went up a bit. You know, before, before the big 2014 change when everybody will be able to get insurance, were they getting prepared for the time when, when they're going to be hit, or what happened? Well, I don't think we really know all the, all the details. They did go up, although interestingly, the rise in health care costs has moderated significantly over the last several years. And so even though they're still going up, they're going up at a slower rate. And uh, the, the belief is that some of the changes in the ACA have, have led to that a lot of the the uh, movements to push hospitals to operate more efficiently, concerns about unnecessary readmissions to hospitals. Hospitals are, have become very aware of that, and there's evidence that, that that's beginning to have an impact on uh, cost. Now, again, we've got a ways to go, but uh, uh, the uh, belief is that, it, it, that actually cost are, rises are slowing. Do you expect no, Go ahead. And I really think we have to remember that the ACA is not the be-all or end-all of, of health care in this country. Before the ACA was, in pa was passed, we were in desperate trouble. And to, the, to a certain extent, the ACA, through things like the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, has the opportunity to improve the general delivery of health care. But if we don't do something to touch the 40% by some estimates of the care in this country that really isn't needed, then we're really going to be in trouble from a price standpoint. So I think that, that it does begin to raise the question. It couldn't deal with it completely. But the other thing about it is by having the potential for insurance exchanges, there's going to be more of an opportunity for competition in the free market. So if you do develop a health care system that's able to provide high High quality cost at lower uh, uh, price. High quality care at lower price. Then in the market, they're going to be able to price their product less, and we're going to be able to have some true free enterprise, government enabled but true free enterprise. In other words, uh, before the ACA, insurance companies were competing by way of dumping sick people. I mean, the companies that could compete against other companies and actually compete on the marketplace and not go under is the, and, and they were able to do this, it was by way of not insuring people who were sick. Uh, now, however, they're going to have to insure people who are sick, and so they're going to have to find a way to compete by, oh, by finding a better way. The criticism I've heard, though, from an insurance company uh, uh, person uh, on that is that the government is making too many regulations and they don't have a lot of wiggle room in which to try to compete. What's your comment on that? Well, I think once again, that you change the basic premise and there are always opportunities to improve the details. I know the CEO of the largest uh, insurance company in Tennessee once said that she was, was happy with the idea of providing coverage to everyone, but all of her competitors had to do that also. And that once you do that, you do have an opportunity to have a discussion and to decide perhaps there were certain things that were overregulated. But you've got to start from somewhere. And we were in a horrible place before horrible. this started. You made a comment. You said 40% of the cost of health care is wasted in, a, in the U.S. It doesn't surprise me because we're twice as expensive as the next 15 countries. Uh, there is a lot of waste. 
And there are a lot of different ways that we can go after that. Tom, you, you, we talked earlier about that. Could you explain to me where, 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 are, where is that waste? Well, there is the, the care that procedures and care that's done that don't really contribute to improving health. We have an, a tremendously complicated administrative system, uh, or a, a tremendously complicated system to administer, and so just the costs of, uh, of uh, running the administration is somewhere 15 to 20 percent of, of the overall cost. And, and there are many ways that that can be simplified. And in fact, part of the ACA has a, a section that is for administrative simplification. Just, for instance, standardizing the forms that all the insurance companies use so that offices, when they're billing different insurance companies, all use the same form. It, it smooths things out. And uh, there are, uh, uh, we have opportunities. We, we, we need to focus more on prevention and uh, we miss those opportunities, that costs us money. We have people that, that, we have care that's not coordinated so that people bounce from one provider to another and oftentimes tests get duplicated and uh, which both costs money and sometimes leads to more complications. So we could certainly reduce, a long list. We, we reduce costs. Uh, I have one quick question, very quick. Uh, once we change insurance companies so they have to compete in a different way, are they all going to remain viable? Is there going to be a dropping down where you'll end up with one or two insurance companies in the country? I mean, what is your, your take on that? My hope and suspicion is that you're going to have some pretty strong regional companies that know the people and the medical practices and the communities that they live in. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. All right. Well, we'll be back uh, after this. The committee that people are afraid of is IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. And the idea was taken from the uh, Armed Services Base Closing Commission. The idea is when there are tough decisions to be made, uh, politicians can't make them because they have to get elected. And so if you have an independent panel that studies the situation and makes recommendations, maybe that's a better way to control costs. I haven't yet met anyone who likes the idea of this independent payment advisory board. I don't much care for it myself. And so when I said there's problems with the ACA, uh, that's, one. that's one of them, okay? The thing, however, that's a complete misconception is this board is a rationing board. The law specifically prohibits the board from specifying treatments or services that won't be paid for. There actually is no rationing, to my knowledge, built into the Affordable Care Act. And this is one of the many things that I think the opponents are, are blowing out of proportion. And as you said at the beginning, it's really unfortunate this is politicized because good health care coverage for every American should really not be something politicians are disagreeing about, whether you're on the liberal or conservative side. It should be a goal we're all seeking. That's, that, uh, that is a wonderful question. Uh, the, uh, the, he is reassuring uh, of us that the, this, this ration, rationing issue we're all frightened of. And we're also, this panel and this pulling the, uh, the plug on grandma and so on and so forth. Fred, explain a little bit better. Well, Separate issue on the on the death panels. It, it's wonderful for people to have an opportunity to talk with their primary care physician about what they would want to do later in life. That's, that that was it, wasn't it? Unfortunately, has been politicized, but it's it's good basic medical care. The idea of the um, independent medical advisory board was really a way, sort of like in the base closing days, to allow Congress to not be Congress, to make a tough decision but not go through the normal rulemaking process. I really think that many of the, of the medical issues are so complicated that I would hope that those decisions would be made without that kind of intervention, and I have some concerns uh, about that. But we, in, in many ways, we're talking about things like getting better data. You open the show with science. And there's something called comparative effectiveness, where if the three of us as physicians know which of the new expensive latest medical technologies really don't help, then we'll be more inclined and more able 
to educate our patients. We've been working with Consumer Reports and trying to get that information yeah, isn't to that the amazing? public. Yep. They didn't have the medical gravitas, and we didn't have the credibility with the consumer community. And that's really a good partnership for a medical professional organization. And, and we've worked with family physicians and with other medical groups along with Consumer Reports because it's the same concept. You really want to go in and get the best evidence possible to get care for you and your family. And I think, just to get back to the uh, advisory board, Congress is still in charge. The, the, the role of the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, if, if, rise, if the Medicare spending rises above a certain threshold, the, they are obligated to come up with recommendations about ways to, to hold that down. Those recommendations still have to be passed by Congress. The difference is Congress is not allowed to amend them. They either have to vote them up or down. So it, it doesn't violate the basic democratic process, but the history has been that Congress has not been very effective when it comes to limiting things. They like to give <laughs> things away. But but they don't, they're not very good at saying no, and this is a sort of a disciplinary board to say that there are some... There are limits to what we can spend, and but I'm not uh, at all buying the, the rationing issue. The, a, the <laughs> ACP would like to call it a, a rational choice a rational rather choice. than rationing. Yeah. In other words, I would like to be able to do for my patients what I would choose to do for my family. If an expensive procedure is offered that won't help me and might actually hurt me, then I'd rather take the older fashioned one. We have a, a call from Spartanburg, South Carolina. I, Wonderful. Gee, I, I wonder how that, that, we have relatives there and they've been asked to watch. <laughs> Thank you for watching and for calling. But you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take uh, the question from the audience first. We have a questioner. Doctors, uh, <clears throat> I'm a Medicare, I'm, I'm under Medicare coverage as you can tell by <laughs> looking at me. And I'm interested in what ACA, how ACA is going to affect Medicare as we know it today, and specifically for those of us who are covered under a Medicare Advantage plan. All right, let's talk about uh, Medicare. Uh, there's been much said that this will destroy Medicare, uh, that Medicare is going to be very much harmed by the ACA. And I, I know that's a political ball that's, that's flying around. Uh, and I, I don't mean to uh, negate anything. I mean, what's going to happen to the uh, to the to the Medicare program uh, if uh, the worst case scenario for the for uh, the ACA? Tom. Well, the the ACA does uh, make some changes in uh, a number of aspects of Medicare, but and the, the charges have been thrown around that there are seven hundred billion dollars of quote unquote cuts in in Medicare. There really are no actual cuts at all. This is a reduction in the projection of future spending. So, and in fact, during this same time, benefits were actually increased. So that uh, the uh, what what the ACA did was to uh, reduce some of the subsidies to the insurance companies that provide Medicare Advantage, and to also reduce some of the projected payments to a number of other providers. For instance, hospitals accepted smaller payments because they were no longer going to have uninsured patients, and so they would have less uh, bad debt and so forth, and they could accept slightly lower uh, payments. And so what, what the ACA did was actually reduce the projected increase in Medicare costs uh, by a, a total projected amount over 10 years of about $700 billion. But in fact, Medicare expenditures are going to continue to go up. Nothing has actually been cut. Okay. And, and in my area, just at the retail level, there, there were some feelings in the beginning that perhaps the payment to Medicare Advantage programs were a bit generous because the beneficiaries were, well, there was more money expended on behalf of the beneficiaries that some thought might be leading to higher insurance profits. That was trimmed down as part of the package to afford the ACA. I found in my area that a number of the insurers have sort of used their new nimbleness that they're coming and dealing with these healthcare changes to really make their uh, 
their Medicare Advantage products more competitive and more beneficial uh, to both uh, physicians and patients? The, uh, just to follow up on Medicare Advantage, the assumption when Medicare Advantage was introduced was we would allow private insurance companies to deliver the Medicare benefits and therefore it would be done more efficiently. Um, and, and that was certainly a reasonable goal. Unfortunately, it hasn't played out that way, and Medicare Advantage has actually cost Medicare about 15% more than conventional Medicare, even at a time when there's some evidence that the group of patients they were insuring were actually lower risk than those in conventional Medicare. So, so, there, that's so the aim is not, not to reduce it, but to bring it back in line with the spendings, spending on conventional Medicare. Okay. And there's still it'll continue to it'll continue yeah. to be around. No, okay. there's no intent to do away with it. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, there's there, there's still challenges for Medicare, but the Affordable Care Act didn't really change a lot of those and, components. And say it again: uh, seven million people will lose Medicare. Not true. No Not true. way. <laughs> so I've got a, a question about small business. Uh, one real threat, uh, I think, uh, to. Uh, people out there is that the ACA looks to take away, or it's been said, to, to, to really harm small business. I had a, f a dear friend of mine say last night uh, when we were uh, talking this over a, a glass of malted beverage that uh, this is going to destroy uh, business. Uh, so what do you say to the idea of uh, small business, uh, medium-sized business, large business, uh, uh, with this particular uh, issue? Well, first of all, small business has been struggling in the past with affording that. Those of us as employers who chose to cover our employees face higher bills every year. I was at a meeting once sponsored by IBM where they pointed out that, that perhaps six or seven percent of their payroll costs went to health care. And they asked the small businesses in the room if they perhaps paid a couple of percent more. And hands didn't start going up until it was at 12 percent, and I think it ended at about 20 percent. So you had some small employers who were paying three times as much as IBM for health care. There are many elements of the Affordable Care Act that have an option for medium-sized businesses to, to get that uh, care spread over a larger group, and then small businesses under 50 employees are exempt, period. In other and words, they, they don't have to do anything. I mean, but, they're, they're, but their employees who currently may not be covered will may be have covered. a chance to get subsidized care, so it's really a win-win. They hopefully have been feeling guilty in an employer-based system of health care of not being able to provide coverage for their employees, and in this case, the employees are going to have access. Because there's, there's good evidence that, that uh, businesses that do offer insurance coverage uh, get a, a healthier and more productive workforce. And that certainly is the goal of every employer. And, and one of the really unfortunate things over the, the, pre, the existing system is that individuals got the worst deal when they bought health insurance. Small businesses got the second worst deal. And, and large businesses got uh, far and away the best deal. Be and it has to do with how much it costs to administer an insurance policy from the insurance company's point of view. And there's a huge difference between what it costs if you've got 1,000 employees as opposed to if you've got two or three. Uh, and, and that gets rolled into their premium. But, but the ACA has a variety of ways of, of leveling the playing field so that hopefully small employers will be at uh, a much less of a disadvantage. It, it's still going to be a challenge. So, and there's these companies that make a lot of money, have a large business, and we've got to move quickly, but uh, have a large business, and they have a lot of employees that are under 30 hours yeah. and are poor, and uh, this is going to cost that big business uh, a it's lot of money. Some of the largest companies in the country depend on Medicaid to pay the health care costs for their employees, some of the very most profitable companies. Oh, any comments about that? So it seems that this is a, it's going to encourage people to move in, in another direction. We have a, a, another a comment coming. The way payments are made to various doctors or, uh, or medical organizations are thought by some to be out of balance. What are the consequences of this disparity and does the ACA address that? Hello, I'm, I'm Matthew Owens. I'm a 
family physician up in Redfield, South Dakota. I practice medicine in a uh, critical access care hospital in a federally designated uh, rural frontier county. Uh, we've been experiencing, even prior to my arrival, a chronic recurrent shortage of primary care physicians. Um, I'm not new at the healthcare game. I started as U.S. Army medic in 1981, took my first pager almost 31 years ago. Uh, now moving on as a physician, carrying almost a similar pager, or being on call, um, I find that the United States, we're just not doing a very good job of producing primary care physicians that are willing to work in the medical underserved areas. Medical underserved areas 20 years ago met rural. Medical underserved areas now can include inner city, um, even moderate sized city. Our problem that we're dealing with in the United States is we pay for services of invasive type procedures extremely well. We do not pay for preventative services. We do not pay for cognitive services. Uh, we need to move to our healthcare system that pays for people to actually sit down and think about what are we buying, what is the outcome of this procedure, and how could we have prevented that procedure from even needing to happen. As far as uh, providing those services, yes, there's some improvement we can do with outsourcing as far as remote technologies. There's things we can do like currently Avera is doing with EER. Yes, they're helpful, but it does not cure the underlying problem of where uh, some healthcare providers are paying, being paid by a factor of 10 uh, compared to doing the same sort of, of work in a rural environment. There's the, the government, the current situation is with Medicare Medicaid reimbursement uh, has not kept pace. If it was, then we would not have the shortage. The fact is, if we really lived in a capitalist system, when you have a shortage of something, in this case, rural internists, rural pediatricians, rural surgeons, rural family docs, you'd be paying them a lot more than the same, their same counterparts in an urban area if we truly had a capitalist system. We do not. This system is broken. Uh, the I issue about uh, primary care payers, uh, uh, physicians, and care providers are on the lowest end of the pay scale and, and physicians, and he's bringing the point up that uh, that disparity of uh, distribution of, of payment uh, has pulled people out of primary care and people are going into dermatology and, and, uh, and brain surgery. Uh, what, but we need more general interns. What's, what's, what's the uh, ACP say about that, Fred? If I had to give one bit of advice to people listening or, or here presently about health care, it would be to find a great family physician, internist, or pediatrician for everybody in your family. And that ought to be your entrance into the health care system. Data suggests that areas that have more primary care doctors have lower costs and better outcomes. And there are models now that move toward payment. Uh, I'm looking right now at a, at a plan where primary care doctors would, would be paid well to care for a group of, of patients. And in exchange, those patients would have 24-hour phone access, email access, seven-day week uh, uh, walk-in clinic availability. And this is in a small town. And to me, that's the kind of healthcare system we need to move to. Somebody has pain in your shoulder, you walk into an orthopedist office these days, you're gonna have an, uh, an MRI often before you even see, see, a, the doc see a doctor. <laughs> that's what has to stop in this country because in, in a third of the cases, you end up having to have, an have a follow-up of an incidental finding on the MRI, yeah. which costs thousands more dollars. We're just not spending our money wisely, no. and we don't have access to the, to the health care system. And, and there are a lot of different ways this needs to, to happen, but that's a great place to start. Well, and, but the ACA doesn't do enough in this. I the ACA does more than Nothing. was present before. Yes. But, but we have friends in the business community who really are, are saying this. IBM uh, has a sort of a roving ambassador that, that talks about health care reform, and they comment that if one of their employees can name a primary care physician, doesn't even have to have a relationship, but can name <laughs> one they would go to for a problem, their costs are going to run about 40% less, less than the rest <laughs> of the IBM employees. Let's think about that. I mean, uh, and I, th I contend that the big, big cost 
driver is the emergency room because it sets up the stage for that admission to the hospital. Tom. The, uh, the, the other, to, to extend on what Fred just said, the, uh, one of the things that the ACA does do is uh, put in place support for what we know as the medical home, patient-centered medical home, there are other terms. And that's a, uh, a model that in many cases uh, many of us believe we've been doing in the past, but when it's done in a really organized way, there, there are some systems around the country that have remarkable uh, evidence of what they've done. I just uh, visited with some folks out in Seattle, Group Health in Seattle, which is a big uh, uh, cooperative program. They insure about 600,000 people in the uh, Seattle area. And they just spent a lot of money increasing their focus on the medical home structure and have shown they have had cost decreases, patient improvement in satisfaction, improvement in patient satisfaction, improvement in physician satisfaction. And what they did was they actually lengthened appointment times so that patients have more time with their doctors, they gave, and they, uh, they contact patients before their appointment, after their appointment, make sure there aren't any loose ends. And it, so they spent more money, they invested resources in primary care, just as you were talking about, but, but they reduced their uh, overall cost. They reduced their emergency room use and they reduced their hospitalizations. And so it was a win-win, win-win-win-win-win. Win-win. Yeah, all the way around. <laughs> and, and I've reviewed the data. I visited with them. A good friend works there. But it's fascinating that but the patients show increased satisfaction. Their outcomes are better. But several of the doctors who did their initial pilot project were nearing what they perceived to be retirement age, and they wanted to get out of the rat race of medicine. They decided to re-up after becoming involved in a patient-centered medical home because they said, I'm taking care it's, of patients again. It's what I went into medicine to do. Changes things. The problem is that not enough of our med students are going into it I mean, you know, we can talk about the value of this wonderful patient-centered medical home, uh, but, it, you know, there might not be enough homes well, that's for a, which to go to. It's a serious question, and uh, because we know that if you look around the U.S. or if you look at, at other countries around the world, those that are truly effective and, phys and uh, efficient uh, all have a solid primary care base. And uh, that, if, whether you're looking at Britain or Canada or places in Europe, uh, that, that do uh, things at a significantly lower cost than we have and have better outcomes, it's, uh, they all have that in common. Well, we are going to uh, do a, uh, an extension of the uh, streaming. So the people that are watching this on the Internet, and you can go to oncalltelevision.com, Com and find the streaming and watch us just like the Daily Show. You know, you can watch a little bit more of the interview. Uh, so we'd encourage that. We may go a little longer. There are a few questions. Uh, so uh, if you want to do that, go to st streaming. That would be good. If you want questions, go to 888-376-6225 and, and call in questions. We're still answering questions. Um, I, I'm thinking uh, we want to run through some questions very fast. Are you ready? Quick answers. Uh, is it true that by 2014, Medicare people will be paying much higher premiums? That's a separate issue, and it depends on the way Congress interprets the right. law. Why, uh, okay, why can't we do free medicine care for everyone like poor countries like Trinidad? And this is a ven veteran who has had experience. We're doing it now. They're going to the emergency room. We, we, that's a goal. We need to make sure that we move toward a structure where everyone has access, and that's what we're trying to do, but it's a big challenge. Winston Churchill once said that Americans always do the right thing. They just try everything else first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, why does uh, supplemental insurance, Medicare, prescription prices increase every year? Why can't it stay the same? It's become too expensive. There, that's a, a million-dollar question. It's, it's a Literally. direct result of the... Uh, <laughs> overall increases in cost that Fred was just referring to, and uh, that's where we have to, uh, as long as general costs go up, those premiums will go up. But anyone who's a patient, if you're getting a brand name medicine, ask your doctor if there's a generic available in that category. Push for the it's one generic. of the biggest opportunities, because there are prescription plans that favor generics that generally have lower premiums. 
problems. Uh, here's another question, Obama, and let's say it again. Obamacare decreases Medicare by $7.6 billion. Will this result in hospitals and clinics turning away Medicare patients? Is that a truth? There's, there's no evidence for that now. I mean, uh, and so... Uh, no. No. No, no there, uh, that is not the truth. It's saving that much money. They turned the numbers. Doctors' thoughts on new medical uh, Medicare laws, Medicare laws. Uh, we just kind of addressed that. Does everyone have to buy health insurance after this? And the answer is, it's, it's forcing people to buy insurance, but they don't, the, the, the criticism has been that the penalty for not getting insurance is, is not enough. Well, it, it's relatively small. If you have religious objections, it's only for a period of, of three months or, or longer. Uh, and it's really a free enterprise attempt to incentivize everybody to go into, into the system. And the, the, the interesting part about that is that the most popular part of the ACA is the requirement that insurance companies take everyone without regard to pre-existing condition. They can only do that if everyone is in the insurance pool. Right. And uh, otherwise, the insurance companies are non-viable. And if you're going to go to the emergency room after an injury or a major illness, you're really taking advantage of the system if you hadn't bought insurance. Great. We'll be back after this. privilege to attend a National Internal Medicine Committee discussing the proposed new ACA health care bill prior to its passing the U.S. Congress. And during the discussion, I resolutely said the bill should do more to control costs. The chairman of the committee responded, hey, of the two major issues, one, giving access to those uninsured, and two, controlling costs, it makes sense to start with access first. If, if we start with co cost first, we will never get back to access. The room went silent as the truth of his statement uh, sank in, reflecting the ethical importance to providing some level of quality care for all and the complexity of controlling costs. Prior to the ACA, Insurance companies have had to compete by not covering or insuring sick people and thus controlling their own costs. The major thrust of the ACA bill is to push insurance companies to cover everyone and let the insurance companies find another way to compete and to control costs. The conversation then turned to a discussion about why Obama reform the insurance industry rather than simply making a single-payer system uh, to pay for uh, health care. The answer came, well, yeah, but it would be less complicated, but it makes sense to encourage private enterprise rather than government to work out a better way to control costs. There are too many lobbyists to expect the federal government to do it. It's been more than three years since this conversation and the health care law was passed. In 2014, the ACA will advance to require insurance companies to cover everyone, even with pre-existing conditions, and to defray the cost of access to all. Everyone will be required to have insurance, like what we have required for anyone owning an automobile. There are those that argue the ACA relies too much on regulation rather than harnessing market forces, should give insurance companies more wiggle room to control costs, and needs to be more radical in cutting certain wasteful programs. Well, I believe th these criticisms are appropriate. The ACA has room for improvement and it can be refined. But I'm afraid if we recklessly dump the ACA to more aggressively go after the cost issue, we will likely forget the access issue and leave millions uninsured once again. We cannot forget the ethical importance to providing access and care for all. We have about two minutes left, gentlemen. <clears throat> we have touched on uh, all sorts of issues. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about what other countries are doing. Um, we haven't said a lot about liability. Uh, we haven't uh, really dragged in the individual mandate and, and uh, the penalty too much. 
Uh, and and we, uh, you know, I don't know that we've talked enough about small business. We've got a little time to talk. Take home message. To, to me, the, the whole issue of healthcare reform is a national challenge, and, and it's even a bit of a national embarrassment. We have many developed other wealthy countries that cover their whole population at substantially lower costs and, and get better outcomes than we do. That, we, that's a challenge, and Americans rise to challenges. We need to figure out a better way to do this, and I believe that this legislation gives us a start. It's going to have to be tried and worked on, but it, and it's only a start. But. Fred? Well, I've talked about this topic throughout the country and in, uh, around the world, and to me it's fascinating. A number of people are afraid they're going to give up what's great about American medicine. I think this is probably the best place in the world to have a heart attack. You're going to get the most acute intervention, probably one of the more likely places in the industrialized world because of our lack of preventative care and lack of coverage. We've got to do more. This brings to a close for the broadcast portion of our show on the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The broadcast of our program will be ending on South Dakota Public Television, but we will continue for a bit streaming on the internet. You'll still be able to call in and email your questions and, uh, and give us uh, uh, our, the, the numbers. If you are not already watching, so we want to thank you. Funding for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.